All right, today we're going to talk about uh, one of those subjects in geometry that everybody's afraid of for no real reason. Um, we're going to talk about proofs. Uh, we're going to talk about reasoning and justifications for things. But really, when people think of geometry, this is what they're most afraid of. Fortunately for us, we're going to handle it from an approach of we're not going to do them s straight from the beginning. We're going to do it in the in the context of this is the type of problem you'll most likely see because, in all honesty, um, when you do any sort of large examination, because of the nature of the examination, it's probably going to be uh, multiple choice or whatever. So we're going to look at it a little bit from that perspective. But at the same time, we're also going to you know understand that some tests aren't that way, so you can work them out. But I hope I don't shortchange it, but I'm trying to make it not seem so scary. Now, when I'm asked to uh, find a proof, what they're asking me to do is to uh, show a reasonable and logical justification for something that I'm doing. Like, um, I know that two segments, uh, say a point is the midpoint of two segments. Well, I need to prove when I solve something out to find what x is, for instance, I need to prove uh, how I got there. You're already doing most of it in your head anyway, you just didn't know the names for them. So when I have a proof, usually there's something called a given. That given is whatever the problem provides. It may tell me that one angle is equal to another angle, or so for instance in my sample midpoint problem, you'll often see this. Well, it's already giving me that A a, B, and B, C are the same, or they'll tell me that B is the midpoint. That's a given. Um, from there, I have to explain how I find the value of something. Say they give me an X value for A, B, and they give me one for B, C, like one is 2X plus 5, and the other is 3X plus 9. I need to find the value of X. Well, you could do that, most likely, uh, but in this case, we have to prove why it, happen, or why it happens. And there's three ways I can go about doing that. The first is knowing definitions. If I know that, if they tell me, or the given is that BC is the midpoint, the fact that I know that AB is equal to BC is because I know that the definition of a midpoint is that it breaks a segment into two equal parts. So my response to that would be not some off-the-wall thing, but just that I know that AB is equal to BC because that's the definition of a midpoint. I was taught that earlier. The next set is properties. There is a ton of properties that you can use to prove it. We're going to focus on about nine very, very simple properties. Don't get overwhelmed. So let's take a look at a few of those. The first property, uh, these are properties of equality. And there's properties of congruence as well, and we'll get into those in just a second. Uh, the properties of equality, the first basic four are addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. All this means is that if I know something, like I know what x is, if I add something else to it, say y or 7 or whatever, say I know that x is equal to the same thing that z is equal to. In addition, that means I could add something to x, and it would be the same thing as adding that same amount to z. Another time you're going to use it is in a situation like uh, when you solve an equation. So say I have uh, 3 x minus 1 equals 15. Well, my logical, wow, that's really small, isn't it? 3x minus 1 is equal to 15. Well, I know that I'm going to solve it by adding 1 to both sides. I can do that because it's opposite operations and blah, blah, blah. Well, the justification for that is that the addition uh, um, property of equality says it's OK. Because if I know this side is equal to this side, if I add 1 to this side and to this side, it's still equal. I don't have to make this into a greater than, less than. So that's my justification. And my justification will be that it's the addition property of equality. Same thing for subtraction. If I subtract something from both sides of an equation, uh, no matter how I do it, then my proof is that is the uh, subtraction property of equality. So when I have um, x plus 7 equals 10, it's OK to subtract 7 from both sides. My agreement is that I'm doing so because of the subtraction property of equality. Same thing when I multiply or when I divide. It's not, by the way, if you are used to my terminology, it's not the operation that's shown. It's the operation that you use to uh, get to the next step. Three kind of odd uh, properties that we have to talk about are uh, simple ones, are reflexive properties, symmetric properties, and transitive properties. The reflexive property just says that if something is uh, 
on one side of the equation and it's also on the other that they're equal to each other. So say I have um, x equals x, I have x plus 5 equals x plus 6 or whatever. My agreement is that the 5 on both sides of this equation is equal to the same thing and the x's as well are equal to each other. I'm not uh, this is like a sort of a modified version of the addition when I add put the plus in there. But the idea is that this x and this x are the same. I may need to uh, explain that a little better when I get to congruence, but you'll see it's pretty simple. It's just that if it's on one side of the equation, it's on the other. They mean the same thing. It's my personal agreement that I'm not going to make x worth 7 here and all of a sudden we're 2 over here. That doesn't happen. Um, my symmetric means that I can flip their uh, as long as I know that something is equal to something else, I can flip their order if I want to. So say I know that 2x is equal to y, well I could also say y is equal to 2x. That's kind of convenient when I'm um, trying to solve for y or you know whatever. You, would, you know when you would flip it around if you need to. Transitive states that if I know that a equals b and b equals c, then a is equal to c. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, if I know that a is equal to 8, and I know that um, c is equal to 8, then I can say that a is equal to c is equal to 8. So you can change out the b, the comparative, uh, the transitive uh, term, just take it out completely, and it just says a equals c, because we know they're equal to the same thing. The substitution property is really simple. It's just the idea that if, say, I know um, that angle... 5 is equal to 70 degrees. Anytime I write a statement with angle 5 in it, I can easily substitute in 70 degrees as long as I already know that relationship is equal in the first place. It's just when you would plug in something for x when you do your uh, problems, that's substituting. You're using the substitution property of equality. And it's equality when there's an equal sign. And the last one is a distributive property, which you've probably done 10 million times. But if I go from a step that looks like this to a step that looks like this, I'm going to justify it because it works through the distributive property. I can also add into this, which sometimes it's hard to, to remember, is that combining like terms also falls under the distributive property heading. So if I have 2x plus 6 plus 3x and I combine 2x and 3x to make 5x, that's distributive property. It's really simple to do, so don't get really overwhelmed by the whole thing. Um, it's not as big of a deal as it would seem. So let's look at one and see uh, what the problem type we might have is. What the question will generally say when you work with equality anyway is that you need to justify each step. So I have this, what is the value of x? And I see that AOM and MOC make a nice straight line. Uh, my straight line is terrible. You're going to assume that it's a nice straight line. Uh, now. I need to uh, justify each step that I'm doing. The first thing I'm going to do before I do anything else is just look to make sure this matches the logic that I have in place. So yeah, I would say that this plus this equals 180, so that's there, and then I plug the values in, okay, and then I'd combine the like terms, all right, and then I would subtract 30, and it gives me this, and it would give me x equals 50. So yeah, that's exactly the match that I would have. So if you have a justify each step question, make sure the thing matches what it should say, or it looks like how you would solve the question. So when I have um, this relationship written down, uh, the given may be... Uh, isn't in this problem because they're not ha it's not a proof yet but I wanted to show you earlier that there is a given so now I know that AOM plus MOC equals 180 the reason that I know that is because of the definition of supplementary angles so I will put definition of supplementary angles that's why it works because that's the definition that I already know the next step has me put the value of AOM, which is 2x plus 30, in beneath it, and then plug it in here. I'm substituting. So the justification is the substitution property. Of equality. Why is it equality? Because there's an equal sign. So substitution property of equality. The next thing I need to do is see what the next step does, and I'm combining like terms. I'm just putting this and this together. When I combine like terms, that falls under the heading of 
distributive property. Distributive property of equality, because there's the equal sign. That's all I did was combine like terms. It's really simple. The next step, 3x is here, but this has gone down. So in my head, I would, if I was solving this normally, I'd subtract 30 from both sides. So since I need to subtract to make this happen, the next step would just be the subtraction property of equality. Very, very simple. And the last one, the next step that I would do is this is times 3x, so I need to divide. So I would say that the final uh, justification is the division property of equality. You know how to go from here to here at this point. It's very simple to go from here to here. You just have to justify why you did it or say what steps you used. Very simple. That's all you have to do for justifying each step. Find out what you're doing and go from there. Not a big deal. Now let's talk about properties of congruence. A couple of the properties can be equal and they can also be congruent. If you forgot, congruence looks like this. It's the equal sign with a little tilde over the top. Generally it means it's just like a huge generic term for equal. Uh, segments are congruent because they measure the same length. Uh, angles are congruent because their angle measurements are the same. So it's really just uh, another way of showing it. I just wanted to show you some examples of when you would actually use them. So say I have a reflexive scenario, and I know that 1 and 3 are equal. We'll actually do a problem like this in just a minute. I need to know that when I, comp when I put the 1 and 2 together and the 2 and the 3 together, that that 2 is going to have the same value. So the reflexive property here or of congruence is that the measurement of angle 2 is congruent to the measurement of angle 2. I'm just justifying the fact that, yes, when I combine the 2 and the 3 together, it's the same angle measure for 2 as if I combine 1 and 2 together. I just need to be able to prove that. Symmetric means that I can flip the order if I need to. So I have vertical angles here. So I know that the measurement of angle 3 is congruent to the measurement of angle 4. I already know that to be true. Now, sorry, that's a little bit badly drawn. Okay, so I know that is the case. What I can do with it when I flip the symmetry over is that, say I needed to make a statement about 4 and 5, like, hey, wait a minute, I know that 4 and 5 are corresponding angles. So if I could say, but I need to say something about 3, like they asked me about 3, and I forget all about the fact that, oh yeah, 3 and 5 are alternate interior angles, whatever. But just say it would be very helpful for me to look at uh, this in a different direction. It would be okay for me to flip this over. That's the symmetric property of congruence. If you see the little tilde over the top, it's a property of congruence. If it's an equal sign, it's a property of equality. Yes, you do have to write that down. And the last one would be transitive. So let me just uh, take a look at this. I have two parallel lines. I've got the transversal. I'm going to do stuff that we've done before. Uh, I'm going to pick an angle, mark its vertical, mark the alternate interior, and then mark its vertical. Now, I know that angle 1 and angle 2 are congruent. I also know that measurement of angle 2 and the measurement of angle 3 are congruent. Now, through the transitive property, even if I didn't have all this marked up, I could say that the measurement of angle 1 is congruent to the measurement of angle 3. And the reason I could say that is because angle 2 links them together in the congruence. So the transitive property of congruence, it, it basically means that I have the same basic term and it's congruent to two different things. So I can say those two different things are congruent to each other. That's the transitive property. Here's the type of question you'll get with that most of the time. Name the property of equality or congruence used to go from statement 1 to statement 2. So in A, here's A, I'm going from A, uh, num statement 1, 2x plus 9 equals 19, which means this, by the way, is going to be a property of equality. So I'm going to go ahead and write equality down, save myself time. 
Now it's at 2x and 10. But if I was in my brain getting out of the fact that, oh, this is so weird and different, it's not. If you had this and you're trying to solve for x, you would subtract 9 from both sides, right? So it's a subtraction property. Subtraction property of equality. That's it. That's a subtraction, by the way. Sorry about that terrible handwriting. Really, really small. That's really helpful. Now, look at this one. This is, they have the congruent symbols, so this is a property of congruent. O, W, uh, measurement of angle O, or me angle O is congruent to angle W, and angle W is congruent to angle L. Well, I see angle W in both. See it here and here? That means there's a link between the two, and if it's going to prove that this is equal to this, I know what it is. See, this is equal to this. So this is transitive property. There it is. Simple. And this should be congruence instead of congruent, but transitive property of congruence. That's what justifies it. And the last one, it's a property of equality. ME, uh, measurement of angle E is equal to measurement of angle T. Measurement of angle T is equal to measurement of angle E. See how they're just the same thing flipped over? That's the symmetric property. Symmetric property of equality. Very simple, right? You would think it'd be harder than this. It's really, really, really not, I assure you. Now, from here, we're going to go into the super scary stuff. It shouldn't be super scary, but for some reason it is. the two column proof. The two column proof is really simple. The first side of it is just the stuff that you did. It's like writing each step out when you solve an equation. If you write all your steps out anyway, you're good. If you're a substituter or you're lazy, then you're doomed. But not really. You just have to learn to do it. You're just writing each statement out. You'll start with a given statement, just like I said we would start out with. Start with a given statement. You'll end with whatever they say to prove. Uh, they'll say prove this, and you'll see in the examples what that means. Over here, you justify why you did it, just like you did before. How you justify it, there's three different ways to do it. There's definitions. Well, I know what it is, so definition of supplementary angles, for instance. That's definitional. Properties. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Uh, reflexive, symmetric, transitive, distributive, substitution. All those properties are available in equality and some of them in congruence as well. And the last is postulates. Sometimes you have to use it. Angle addition postulate, segment addition postulate, those are pretty common. Any other postulate that you might pop up that you could use to solve with. It's much easier if I just get into one and show you most likely what that's going to look like. So here's a nice little two column proof question. Given measurement of angle one and measurement, uh, given measurement of angle one equals measurement of angle three, here's the drawing that they're re referencing. Measurement of angle one and three are both marked with one line, which means they're the same. I'm supposed to prove that measurement of AEC, which I'm going to highlight out real fast. There's measurement of angle. There's measurement of AEC, is equal to the measurement of DEB. So this one. And as you should be able to see, this AEC thing they're talking about is really angle 1 and angle 2. And DEB is angle 3 and angle 2. It's just like that's how they want you to organize it. Using a highlighter, by the way, is awesome. Um, it'll make your math life better. Statements. The first statement is measurement of angle 1 is equal to measurement of angle 3. Well, if you look here, da, 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 it's the given. So I'm just going to write that the reason that I decided to write that down first is that it was given to me. I'm not a genius. Uh, the next statement, if we derived it or working out from the problem as it's assigned, measurement of angle 2 is equal to the measurement of angle 2. A, duh. And B, the reason that you have to do that is because we're going to to make AEC, we're going to add 1 and 2 together. To make DEB, we're going to add 3 and 2 together. If we don't remind people that the 2 that we use when we make this angle is the same value, or measured angle, the measurement of it, is the same as the 2 we use when we do this, it could get confusing, because angle 2 could mean lots of things. So I'm going to say that this is the reflexive property.
Uh, and the next step says measurement of angle two, uh, one plus the measurement of angle two is equal to the measurement of angle three plus the measurement of angle two. Well, if we know that one and three are the same, if we add two to both of them, it's going to give us the same thing. So I'm adding, and it's still equal. Oh, that screams addition property. of equality. I'm going to use EQ there. The next one says that the measurement of angle 1 plus the measurement of angle 2 equals AEC. So I'm going to look 1 plus 2 equals AEC. If you were doing the uh, addition angle addition postulate thing we were working on before, uh, that really works out. I always had you write the name of the big one equals the two little ones together. Same thing here. 3 and 2 equals DEB. So the reason that that worked is because of the angle addition postulate. Because you would write that down. If you're in my class anyway. You'd write down this one equals this plus this. And then you'd plug in X's and blah blah blah. So the angle addition postulate is why you do it. The last one is the measurement of angle AEC is equal to the measure of angle DEB. Well, really what we're doing is taking the information we know about this and plugging it in here and taking the information we know about this and plugging it in here. Plugging it in is known as substitution. Of equality. That's it. That's all you have to do to do proofs. It's not that hard, uh, especially from this trend, uh, from this point. Now, let's look at one more that you might see. And like I said, this assumes you're probably working through a book system somewhere, and you're not deriving them from your head. If you are deriving them from your head, you're probably at a point, hopefully, where you're going through why you did things. And it's really just justification. But this is the type of problem you'd get on like a multiple choice test. C is the midpoint of AD. Well, okay. Then uh, that's my given. My proof is x equals 6. Well, to make my life easier, I'm just going to solve this thing really fast in the way that I would normally solve it. And then I think everything kind of opens itself up. If I know c is the midpoint of AD, then I know that AC is equal to CD. And then I would plug in the value of 4x and plug in 2x plus 12. Then I would uh, subtract 2x from both sides. I'm just solving it out as I normally would. Well, it does equal 6. All I have to do now is justify those steps. The first point is that C is the midpoint of AD. It is the given. So I'm going to write where A is given. By the way, anything in red, uh, anything in blue is what the book, when I looked up this problem, gave me. The red stuff is the stuff I'm supposed to add. Now, I need to know that AC is congruent to CD, so I need to know this is equal to this. Well, the easiest way for me to know that information is simply to know the fact that, um, sorry, kind of lost my brain there for a second, is because I know what a midpoint is. So my justification is the definition of a midpoint. Because I know that C breaks it into equal parts, otherwise it wouldn't be a midpoint. The next one says AC is equal to CD, or uh, and their justification is that congruent segments have equal length. Well, yes, they do. Sometimes you would add that stuff, and sometimes you would. They like to really work it out when they do proofs, but either way. Now, the next step is I'm taking the value, just like I did up here, and plugged in, or the uh, segment name and plugged in the value. When I'm plugging it in, once again, that's substitution. Property of equality. It's important to put equality there. This question doesn't have a congruence. So this isn't a property of congruence, it's a property of equality. This one says the subtraction property of equality. Well, if I did the problem already, it makes a lot of sense. So I go from this step to this step. You take this part of it out. This is assuming it's already been done. So I'm just going to write 2x equals 12. I went from here to here by subtracting. If you show your work, this makes it way easy. And finally, I would got to x equals 6. The way that I got there was by dividing. So the final thing is that division property of equality. Very simple. 
shouldn't be a big deal. Um, work in teams of two today. And I'll go ahead and tell you that I probably won't have a video for Tuesday because we're going to do the same exact thing. So maybe you work in groups of three on Tuesday and you get your group in here. And then when I come back on Wednesday, things will look really good if you're in my class. If you're just watching this for your own because I threw it up on YouTube or something, obviously that has nothing to do with you, so don't worry about it. But uh, it's not really that hard. Think about what you do. If you just solve the things out and then match to the properties, you should be in good shape. So good luck.